Hello, everyone. Welcome. Have you ever wondered how to get a product invention into stores? We're going to be talking about that today with our expert guests. Stay right there. It's too good to miss. Welcome to Coffee with the Queens, empowering you to grow and protect your cash, credit, castle, and kingdom. Have you ever heard the phrase, get your ducks in a row, and you feel like you haven't done that? We share learned lessons and practical advice to help guide you to a life of financial freedom. Empowerment is key. So grab your coffee and crown and let's get to it. Take it away, Queen Tammy. Good morning, Queen. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Um, today is a really interesting topic. We are talking about, <clears throat> you know, there's so many people that, you know, when we have a problem, we, we look for a product, right, to fix it. And sometimes there's that product doesn't exist. And you think to yourself, well, I should make, you know, I should make that product, I should bring that product to market. And, you know, sometimes we start think, thinking about it seriously. We write it on a napkin. We might even name it, brand it. We might even think about the costs. And then we might even make a demo of it and bring it to market. So I'm interested to know, because we have this expert guest on today who's going to help us on this topic. We're all entrepreneurs here. So where in the process have you ever done this? Where in the process are you? And if you were, did you bring it to market or didn't you? And why, where, you know, why, what's holding you back, I guess? <laughs> well, question. I know, I know that, Dami, you actually have, you've done this with your puppy product or with your pet products. And mm -hmm. um, I, I never, I, I had two inventions that I, that I patented, but never brought them to fruition. The, mm -hmm. the demo, the, the sample that we tried to create never worked very well. And so I let it go thinking that was not my forte. Kind of glad I did. It's not where I am I'm supposed to be. So it's okay. But I did learn a little bit about the process of um, creating products when I, made my first attempt at a uh, business outside of acting, which was creating a company called Serenity Salts. And they were bath salts <laughs> infused with uh, natural oils because that was my thing at the time. And I thought, well, I need something that's really pure and I wasn't finding it at the time. So I did these and I wanted pretty bottles. So I found these beautiful bottles and I bought several, really truly just several cartons of them. And I created these bath salts through all of this work in my living room and thought I had poltergeist at one point because I was making these salts in my living room and my walls started to weep. Oh, and I God. called my dad. I'm like, what is this? He goes, where are you making these bath salts? I'm like, in my living room. He goes, it's the water condensation. <laughs> so, hey, learning the correct location for creating things is good. <laughs> and then B, I was lucky that I could actually get it into... Um, some of the high-end local boutiques. And I really felt like this was where people were reordering it. And then I ran out of supply of those beautiful jars. Mm. And the next step was for me to order them directly from China. And I had to order 100,000 at a time. Hmm. That, that was the end of that. That could be a block. <laughs> yeah, that could definitely be a, a big block. It was a process. big jump. Yeah. Now, did you store them? them? Did you store them anywhere? Um, I store them in my house. Yes. So I just would wipe my walls down. <laughs> I'd wipe my walls down and, and I made them every week. I mean, I, I made them every week. So they would disappear and then I would make a new batch. I mean, it was fun, but that the, it really woke me up to where you get your, your supplies, your resources is so important. And to think that your one resource for whatever element it is of your invention or your product is going to always be there might be a big mistake. And were you doing this alone? Yes, totally alone. See, that's hard. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. So I'm, you guys know, I'm a creative person. I mean, you could see all my books uh, right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I have programs and books and courses up the gazoo, let me tell you. But you know, I've trademarked so many of my names and taglines and things like this. But again, you just can't keep moving forward without anybody, without a team. And that's my issue. It's like you you have to stop at some point and just halt and, and 
it's like, how do we keep going without, you know, without a team and how to get our products out there? So that's where I'm at. What about yeah, you, Kathy? So mine was a little bit different. Um, my, the first product I built, um, I had just worked, you know, for the federal government for 16 years. And in one of my last jobs, I actually managed the word processing centers. And at that point they were big Xerox computers, you know, and, but I understood the efficiency. So when I left to start this computer store, I thought, wow, I'm going to go create a software app to do word processing, just like it did. So I thought that sounded so simple. And I was lucky I found a development team that knew how to do this. So the next thing was, how do I fund this development? I lived in Kansas mm -hmm. City at the point, and this was way back when venture capital was really not an in thing. So my first challenge was to find a bank that would actually fund a risky business, which obviously yes. software and making an app. And at a time when personal computers were brand new, that was risk to banks. So my first challenge was to find a way to fund the bank to fund the company. So I learned about a little bank in rural Kansas that actually used SBA back loans to fund farmers because farmers are also a very risky business. Yes. So we drove, we talked to him, he said, I'll do it. So we filled out the application. I also put up my home, the equity in my home is oh, the collateral wow. for this loan. Okay. And we actually built the app. Uh, I signed a contract with a big company here in the Valley. We came out and that's when I learned two things. <laughs> number one, the contract negotiations and number two, the timing of the product. So it turned out, yes, my clients love the product, but the world was just changing from one operating system to another. And the guy that managed the money said, well, if you will take this development, move it into the next operating system, I will pay you. I said, I'm a startup. I don't have the money to do this. And so it was a great product. His team said, take him to court and we'll be on your side. But you know, at some point, you know, your life goes in another direction. And that's how I got to California. Wow. And wow. taking him to court can cost you, oh, yeah. you know, immensely as well when you go up against someone right. like that. The, yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. That's the interesting. right product, wrong time, wrong contract. So. And, and also there's products out there that, you know, um, they're not doing well, or if you change a name, it's like it, it, it flourishes, right? So yes. Changing a name, changing right. um, the location of where you're putting it, even in a store can make a huge wow. difference. Right. Um, so I think with my little bath salts, I think that because the package had some pretty stuff on it, they put it where people would see it. Mm. And so I had a little advantage there, you know, because that's just, that was just pure luck, I think, pretty much. Yeah, so there's, there's so much that goes with it, especially branding, mm -hmm. branding, colors, name. So much. Kathy, so what was your uh, stat? Didn't you have a stat that you brought up or you were talking about? Oh, right. So I looked at the stats in terms of how many new products come to market every year. And mm -hmm. the number was 30,000. And of that, most of them fail. 80% of them fail. So anytime wow. you take a risk with a product, uh, there's a lot of risk. All those things we talked about, you know, pricing, <laughs> mm -hmm. distribution, you know, finding that, that match of a message between, like Tammy did this great, this matching of the message between the want and your product and all those other things that go with it. Yes. Messaging yeah. is so important. But all of these that things was, that we're talking about are, are, did you want to say something, Tammy? Oh yeah. That, yeah. um, because, you know, I, I wanted to share this with people because we, we did bring a product to market and it has been successful for the, since 2013 now mm -hmm. and brought several products. And I think the key to it was I had an advantage because I was working at a corporate, um, CPG company, consumer product goods company at the time and my job was to rank their products for sale online. And the key to that was to figure out how people were searching for a, pro a product to yeah. uh -huh. um, solve their, so be the solution to their problem, right? And then to match those keywords. So 
Um, like for example, I was ranking a product called the Diaper Genie, and we figured out that a lot of people were saying the word nappy. Some, you know, yes, when they're yes. looking for diaper bin, so they would say nappy bin. So we would change the verbiage that the consumer was using, you know, for some of the product marketing, and it increased sales. So um, I had that advantage before I brought our product to market. And, and that was also solution based. My mother in law said, I got this new puppy, and she just keeps biting holes in the rug in my very expensive rugs. And I don't know what to do that there's no toy that works. So we bought all the products out there. And we researched what people wanted and what they didn't like. And then we designed a product around something that suited that filled in all of those you know, wants and needs mm -hmm. that the consumer had and, and then brought it to market that way. And that was sort of the key to success for us. So I always say, you know, I, fi I find a lot of people get um, caught up in their beautiful idea just because it came out of nowhere and a right. dream and they try to bring it to market, but really think about the consumer first Yes. And then design your product around the consumer, right? Because ultimately they're the ones. Well, you are one of those people that has a beautiful idea and you're watching the show, do not despair. Because it doesn't mean that your beautiful idea can't actually be the thing that is going to make the big difference for somebody and, and fill a, a need and a want and and be fantastic. So um, I would really like to um, welcome our guest for today. So Amy Winslow has over 21 years of experience in international product development, sales, and management for consumer goods. She uses her experience to share insights on how to position and produce products that will make millions through high volume sales to home shopping channels and mass merchandise. Merchandisers. So we're talking about making some money off of what you are dreaming up right now. She has worked on products so diverse. We're talking surfboards, jewelry, mouthwash, natural cleaning products, clothing, and hardware. You go to her website, you see all of this, you see Home Depot, and you see diamonds. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Amy serves inventors and entrepreneurs as founder and CEO of Products to Profits Incorporated. So we can ask all of the questions, ladies and gentlemen, if you are watching the show and you would love to, to ask some questions, please post them in the chat because I'm sure you will have some. So Amy, welcome. I Hello. am so I'm so glad to be here, ladies. So yeah. excited to meet you. I've got my so tea great. too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All she's missing is the tiara, you guys. Oh, no. <laughs> right. yeah, you know, but um, they're fantastic. I'm so glad to see you all looking so radiant and so smart. Your conversation is always so elevated here. So, oh, well, thank you. you well, that's why we chose you as a guest, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so we can continue this. Yes. We have we're gonna we're gonna pick a brain today. I hope you're ready for that. I know that you can handle it because you've got your mm -hmm. podcast, you've got your show, you've got all the you've constantly got people coming up to you saying, Hey, I have this idea. It could even be on a napkin, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to get it, you want to get it into the market and figure out a way or whether it is something that can really make some money, because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. My my husband jokes, Sandra, I could go to a grocery store and meet somebody in line. Like <laughs> that goes, oh, you have, oh, what should I do about? Um, so we see them everywhere. So I'm happy to have the conversation. And um, I've got a couple examples here if we need them to kind of talk through some concepts too as we go. We'd love that. So what, what is, um, first off, I'm, I'll, I'll go ahead and just launch and then ladies, you know, pipe in. Cause I know we have a whole slew of questions for you today. So we'll get done as much as we can. And, and I know you've got something special for the people that are watching today too. We always have giveaways. We have some good ones today, you guys. So comment because the more you comment, um, the more you have an opportunity to get some, some good free stuff. So why do products fail? First of all, if somebody does manage to get something out, what's the reason that they would fail? There's basically four areas that will cause a product to fail. And Sandra, it comes down to usually there's something wrong in the foundation of the product or the product market fit is off, which goes to the attractiveness of the product, or they don't know how to do the things like ranking, like um, Tammy was talking about just a few minutes ago. So it can be a sales problem. Um, we just had someone I was talking with the other day when we were doing a preliminary conversation and she's actually contacting the wrong places for her product. 
and then wondering why she's not getting phone calls back. That can be an example of a good mismatch kind of situation. And then sometimes it's funding. You know, sometimes the person lets the money stop them when really the right momentum and the right traction in the business um, can attract investors and can, I'm sure that you've all seen that, that people get excited when they really understand the story of the product too. We see that on Shark Tank, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. So it's become like a pop culture phenomenon, that show. And, and because it is that intrigue, that Cinderella thing of small town idea going into something that's big and, and hearing the story behind it, right? Absolutely. I'm very fortunate. I've spoken on stage with a few of the sharks from Shark Tank. We have clients that have been on the show. Matter of fact, we have one on this season. I cannot tell you who they are. Oh, but that's a tease. Watch, watch the show for the next couple of weeks. Okay, tell us what they look like at least. <laughs> Give us a hint on the products. <laughs> oh God, are they Give us fast? anything? I know it's so amazing, but I can't tell you because um, the confidentiality agreement on it is pretty dang strict. Like right, right. I can't even have them on our show and interview them before the episode launches. So, oh, okay. So I know maybe when that happens, you'll you'll put a post on our Facebook group. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would love to do that. It's they're okay. really really awesome people. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you, so my husband made a 25 by 25 foot stage. It goes from literally like 10 feet to 25 and it's huge. It's a huge stage and it is like a platform made out of the ones that you pull on wheels, right? Flat, a flatbed. And he wants to patent it and put it out on the market. So what's the first thing that he could actually start doing and how would he even find funding for it? You know, I love this question um, because I get asked a lot, how do I get started? What should I do next? Which is related to this. So I'm actually one of the speakers for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office occasionally at their conferences on how do you make money from your stuff? I am not an attorney. So everybody, I'm not an attorney. Full disclaimer. We just work with intellectual property a lot. Um, so... The first thing is usually that you'd want to look at getting a provisional patent application. Um, it's kind of unusual. People get it confused. They think they filed, filed their patent when really they filed a provisional application. And I was talking to some of the examiners. I was like, how do you all think about this, right? What, what, how do you treat them, right? So an important thing to keep in mind is that the patent office, like you send in your piece of paper electronically with your idea on it, provisional patent application runs you around $75 as a small entity. So it's really inexpensive. It gives you one year to decide if you're gonna go forward. So you can kind of explore it under this umbrella of a little bit of kind of a time stamp thing, but it's not really patented. You send in your piece of paper, the patent office literally does this. This is from the patent examiner. They go, oh, we got a letter. They stamp the date on it and they put it in a drawer. That is it. They don't look at it. They don't even read it. They just put it in a drawer and they wait for that one year time stamp to come up. So um, if you are going to patent, a provisional patent application is just one step. It's not all the way. Um, so I always like to mention that because a lot of people have that misunderstanding. Does that help you for the first thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, are are then, you protected at all during that time, Amy? Like if it's in provisional patent, do, are you protected from somebody stealing that or no? Well, you're really only protected once you go to the full application, yeah. at, you know, whenever you decide to do that. So like I said, I'm not an attorney, so you really need to run any legal questions like those particulars past an attorney, but we always tell our clients, yes, you can say patent pending, but mm -hmm. it's not really looked at. And because of that, you might find that somebody else has a something in that same status that hasn't been published that you might be infringing on. So it's a little- So how wacky. do you know? So how would you know? So if you send on the, that application, how do you know what to do next? I mean, do you have another application you have to go through? What's the next step within that year or you have to wait a year? 
you you used a year to kind of prove the viability, get maybe get your manufacturing quotes, look wow. at how many of it could you sell, right? We do product differently here. Our clients all do this differently. We do it the way that a large company does, which is way safer and way less expensive than most individual inventors try to do it, or most product creators. Because we work with product startups, we work with established companies, we even work with companies where they've been selling for years, but something's gone horribly wrong, or they never really got the momentum that they wanted to see. So mm -hmm. we fix a lot of the problems. So the next step is always try to figure out how many you could sell of it. Don't just go run around and do inventory, right? Like that's um, risky. Yes. You want to so actually like, think a little bit so, first. So like with Sandra's product, her sea salt or her salt yeah. that she made, what could she have uh, done differently to keep moving forward and to progress? Well, it sounded to me like the bottle supply was a big issue. Yes, so, it was the final issue. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know. So, I didn't know how that, to go around it. Right, and sometimes you can find a different um, source called a stocking distributor, which means that they are actively stocking it. So your distributor may have discontinued it, but somebody else is still carrying it. Mm -hmm. um, there's packaging shows. We have a ton of sources because we've been doing products for a, like multiple decades. We'll just say that. Right. Um, so you want to actually explore the rest of the resources. And I would have suggested finding a co-packer who could do the production so that you didn't yes. have them in your living room. Yes. <laughs> so Margie, Margie is asking, so say you make soy candles and you want to sell those. What is your suggestion? Um, it depends on what level the soy candles are. Usually soy candles are considered more of a premium product. You know, they're not like a beeswax or a petroleum base. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you are in the stage of your business, what I would tell you to do is different. So I don't really have enough information to say exactly. So if you're already making them and you want to sell more and you're already selling some, you want to look at what is the story that you can legitimately ethically weave from the sales that you already have? And how do you leverage the sales you already have to open more conversations? And we work with products that aren't just for retail. They're also selling online. They're selling on TV shopping channels. Yes. Our clients sell in multiple places because ladies, little known fact, if you have one sales channel, one, and you add two more, like say you're in Amazon and you add uh, eBay or you add target.com, you will get, no joke, 324% more sales for just doing that. So if you don't have multiple sales channels, the way that I talk about it is this. Having one of course sales it says channel, Amy's. Of course it's Amy's soup. That's yeah. what you would think. <laughs> I mean, this soup with a fork when you have one sales channel. You're leaving a whole lot and you're working really hard to get what you got. Okay. Right. So 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 can I, in today's world and you have these these choices and multiple channels. Is, do you start online first? Where does actual physical retail fit in the world of the pandemics today? Or do you do you just deal with the big box stores? And this whole thing called Made in America. How does do you see that impacting anything at all about products today? There's a couple layers to this. So mm -hmm. yes, online is super important. Still, even in, in the pandemic, the first two months of the pandemic actually accelerated what's called digital adoption and digital transformation, three to five years in two months. Mm -hmm. right. Wow. Like, wow. That's the migration and how quickly it accelerated, but still fully 70% of sales are still happening offline. Massively influenced by online, so there's direct, direct relationships. This has been going on for a long time, so it's not new to the pandemic. The pandemic just pushed the speed a lot. When we talk about retail, I also think about it as branded retailer sites like walmart.com, target.com, 
Kohl's. Mm-hmm. One of our clients is, is getting picked up by Kohl's. She has her meeting the 5th of um, March. So when you're looking at retail, they're using their online to help prove the success of something before they put it in store. Um, but it's, it's not just in store and it's not just online. That is the reason you have Amazon buying whole, you know, bought whole foods, et cetera. So really important to keep, Oh, sorry. Go on. (laughs) Sorry. So this last piece is that it's really important to think about it. Like what you're doing in their dot com space affects your access to other opportunities. It's, it's a really important proving ground but it's not the whole story. Now, what would you say to somebody who's, you know, like I'm a very creative person, so I have lots of things going on. I have books, I have courses, programs, dance courses, all these things. But, you know, I'm just one person and I've been doing this all my life as a solopreneur and I just can't get ahead more than a solopreneur. So do you advise me looking for a team? And again, if you don't have the funding, what do you do? Because, you know, people are at a standstill. Yeah. So you're describing Mm -hmm. this condition of being an entrepreneur. (laughs) I told you you had eight (laughs) arms. I told you you had eight arms, Sohela. (laughs) That's me. Yeah. You're describing the octopus stage, right? (laughs) Um, And a team prevents that. And, And here's the challenge about getting a team as far as I see it. There's teams that you need at different stages. And sometimes people actually overhire, right? And sometimes they underhire. Like right now, I need to add a couple team members to our team. But when I say overhire, like they go, oh, I need like a digital marketing chief executive. No, you need a good admin assistant, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and the way to start, you know, oh, I haven't talked about this in a long time. Do you want my my secret magic piece of paper for it? Secret Good. magic, yes. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> secret magic piece of paper. It'll be just between the five of us and, you know, the Everyone thousands else. who listen. I'll be on it. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do when you're deciding about a team and who to hire next, a really great strategy for this, you get a sheet of paper. I'll go back to this one. You get a sheet of paper and you make three columns right and one you label hell the middle one you label work and the one on the right gets labeled uh, fun so it's your hell work and fun list you okay. keep that on your desk right as you're working and everything you do in the course of a few days you write in one of those columns based on how you experience it right hell for me is bookkeeping oh my goodness like right I can do it, but it's the thing that's going to really drain my energy. That's a hell item. Work are things that you, you do, they don't light you up, but they don't drain you, right? They're kind of neutral. And fun is everything that, oh my gosh, if you could do that all day, you would like be radiant all the time and you're totally energized. Your job as an entrepreneur who's growing a business is to delegate effectively everything in the hell column first, then everything in the work column, and keep the things in the fun column. Because it'll elevate your energy and you'll actually create a lot better results. The whole exercise takes you like 20 minutes over the course of a couple of days. So it's really strategic. Does that help? Yes. Yes. I love that. Thank you. Because they've actually done studies that you burn more kilocalories when your brain is working in the hell section. (laughs) So you're literally depleting the energy bucket that you have for the day, right? I say you, everybody has the same fill full energy buckets and it drains a lot faster when you're working in the hell action for you. I remember, I remember I attended a a management training course one time. uh, And here's what they taught us. They said, what is stress? Uh, Is stress working 18 hours a day? What is stress? And the answer was, Stress is not working 18 hours a day at a job you like. Stress is working 15 minutes a day at a job you don't like. <laughs> that is a great definition of stress. I mm-hmm. tend to, I always try to stay, I think one of the advantages of age, 
I know what I'm good at, and I try to stay in that bucket. I try to stay in that bucket, and and leave and leave the other stuff to the other people. So, so, so where where do people find funding? Let's say that they have a product. Say, okay, I need some funding to keep moving forward. What would you suggest? It depends on how much it is, right? There's different stages of funding now. I came from an art school background, so I straddle the creative brain and the business brain. And in a weird twist of my career, I've actually spoken on panels with like securities exchange commissioners and you know some <laughs> elite level guys. And I'm like, really me and two SEC commissioners. <laughs> but um, <laughs> when you're looking for funding, it's as much about the story and the fit to the investors. Um, preferred profile of investment as anything, right? There are investors who specifically do what's called seed stage investing, which is kind of what you are thinking of when you're hearing friends and family. Um, but most of our clients are, if they're going out for investment, they're going out for angel funding, which is kind of, you've already done a little bit of proof of concept. You, even if it's a duct tape together model of something, <laughs> we see a lot of that and it's awesome. Like <laughs> collage is great, um, <laughs> but you have to actually be able to prove it. So um, we have a four step process that we use. It's our proprietary process. It's called the fast process. So it's the foundation of a product, the attractiveness of it to the market, then the sales and the traction and traction is actually sometimes getting traction within with the investors. So we have a checklist about this. This is one of the, the um, free gifts for everybody who's been commenting. If you're interested, we'll give the checklist, which will help awesome. with some of this. Thank nice. you. Speaking of yeah. commenting, we have one of our um, viewers here is asking about crowdfunding. Do you recommend crowdfunding at all, like on places like Kickstarter or... Um, it, has that been successful for any of your clients? It has. We have clients that have successfully funded through uh, Kickstarter. And we have the full range from, you know, mom at kitchen table who did her product and actually went on to the Inc. 5000 list top 20 in four years from, from her wow. kitchen table. Um, wow. So... Kickstarter has changed a little bit from when they they started out years ago. Mm -hmm. So you always want to know that you're not just putting something up on a platform and expecting it to miraculously have money raised. You're going to need to drive traffic. You're going to need to have a compelling story. Story. Um, all of our clients who have funded on any crowdfunding platform have always delivered on what they said they were going to do. And we're part of how they do that. So it's really important to take care of your integrity. I have a question, you know, going back to Kathy had asked number one um, about the made in America thing. Do you see that changing uh, at all with, you know, there's been a, a difference in um, administration here. One was pushing a lot of made in America. Now it's not so much a thing. Where do you feel like that is that is important these days? Made in America is a tricky thing in some respects because it really affects the pricing of your product. But what we're seeing right now is, and have for about the past three years, is that in some cases, the freight costs of importing a product have offset the difference in the manufacturing. So some products, when you look at the total investment into getting it into the market, um, net out the same, right? The uncertainty around importing, trying to get things through customs right now has been tough. There are 80 ships in the port of Los Angeles that have yet hmm. to be offloaded. 80? 80? Um, eight zero? Eight zero because there's dock workers out with COVID. Um, oh, this is from a couple of weeks ago, but the, some of those ships wow. actually had Valentine's product on it and it missed Valentine's. Um, mm -hmm. The Made in America you can sometimes get smaller minimum order quantities, which is another reason you might want to do it. Um, there is a couple of sources, like we have a connection in Buffalo, New York, that actually has a whole portfolio of manufacturers that do made in America. 
that they've been updating their technologies and their systems. So Made in America can be really viable. It's also not the thing to hang your hat on to try and make sales or your tiara. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Because it's more like a grace note. Like if people are doing a side-by-side price comparison, same sort of product, same solution to a problem, but the price is drastically different. Made in America won't help you overcome that. But Got it. if it, all other things are equal, Made in America does help. I'm thinking of Tammy with this situation because people can be very addicted. I would have no idea about this to home shopping networks and um, it being, yeah, I've trained people for, for speaking of their own stuff. And I've, I've actually worked with some of the hosts of the show. I've been on it myself. And I know that the amount that they sell when a product is moving is incredible in one hour, what can happen. So there is this idea that that is the end all be all for some products. And I know you and I've talked about this. It's not always so. Um, what is needed to get a product? Let's just say it's jewelry or something along those lines, right? An accessory of some sort, just for the sake of conversation. What would it take to get that accessory through to a successful um, platform like HSN or QVC or something similar? When it comes to jewelry, I have a lot of background. I'm from the jewelry industry originally, um, Mm -hmm. and I worked on a line that sold hundreds of millions of dollars on QVC that was a jewelry line. So um, for a jewelry line, if you are just going to stay in the television shopping channel lane, right, um, you need to start with basically kind of like a catalog sheet, which is the designs. You don't always have to go into production with every product. Secret in the Mm -hmm. back here backstage you don't need to go into production for everything you need to have a few that look really great and use those to make the sale so that you lower your risk right Mm -hmm. um a good sell sheet or a good web presence some some buyers still prefer sell sheets some which is a pdf at this point usually of all the information about why they should buy it, what's the profit margin that they can make off of it, what, how does it fit in the market, et cetera, um, and the logistics of doing business with you. And then other pro- other buyers want to see it through some submission portal. I don't like submission portals. Because, why? well, it's kind of like if you're going for a job interview, and yes. do you want to just <laughs> step on Indeed, or do you want your best friend to refer you? Yes. Like, I, I I want my best friend to refer me, right? It's a lot easier to get into a conversation under that. Yes. It's kind of the same thing. So yes. even if you're putting it up in a portal, if you can find a referral or a connection, you'll do much better. Much. So. Excellent. So, so Tammy, that might be, would you ever think, Tammy, of taking your pet products and putting them on QVC? Yeah, thank you for that question, because it's a perfect lead in to sort of what we experienced. We, you know, I sell on Amazon, because that's my background, right? And that's where we started. Um, So we were approached actually by Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank and um, as seen on TV and his whole um, uh, business, you know, all their colleagues there in in Florida. And what they do is they actually will create commercials for us, um, put the branding, you know, refer us. Um, create, allow us to be a as seen on TV product uh, for one year. And then they actually do TV distribution. So we had some commercial spots with Kevin Harrington um, over the course of a year. The problem, here's what happened, is because we were still on Amazon, the people, you know, heard our product name and they're sitting at home watching TV and then they would just put their product name into their phone or the closest web browser and it would automatically go to Amazon, which is what we didn't want because we had this special offer only through this commercial. So, you know, what is your strategy or how do you um, discuss with your product owners, you know, that that multi-level strategy? You said it's always good to have a couple of different 
um, you know, sources where you sell a couple different vendors, different distribution channels. But what about the competition thing? You know, does one does one outweigh the other or cancel the other sometimes? Have you found that? And and how would one go about trying to do both at once successfully? First off, you look at your pricing. You And I don't mean your retail price. I mean your cost structures. What do you have built in? Okay. So this goes back to, it's related to the sales section of our proprietary process, but it's also related to the foundation section. We actually do pricing work as a foundation piece because what you build into your cost structure determines where you can profitably sell, okay? Yep. The mm -hmm. attractiveness of the product determines how can you sell it, that, that's the packaging, et cetera. So the first thing that you would do is you wanna look at your pricing cost structure, okay? Make sure that you have all the elements built in there. We do a ton on this. I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody who wants to talk about their product line. Um, you need to look at, well, what is the purpose of doing the infomercial or the, the commercials that you were doing? Was it for brand awareness and you still got sales? Or did you really want to drive the sales just through that channel? And that is a marketing expense that may list build. So you can do a couple of things. You can have, I don't, what was your exclusive offer? Was it colors or assortment or what? Yes, what we what we ended up doing was um, we picked just as you described before, we picked three through our three top sellers. And then we said, hey, you can buy one, get one free at a lower cost than they would be able to get on Amazon. Mm -hmm. What you're fighting there, though, is people's already established pattern. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we all sort of know to go to Amazon, a lot of people, but like Abigail was mm -hmm. posting in the comment, she doesn't like buying on Amazon. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to also ramp up the trust factor. So there's some specific strategies that you can use to do that. And um, you want to make sure that whoever's producing your commercials is aligned with what you're trying to cause. And they should be because they usually have a percentage of sales across multiple channels. Mm -hmm. when they do yes. that so mm -hmm. definitely read the contract on um, whenever you're doing right. distribution deals interesting thank you sure Boy, contract though it, they have those little little uh fine lines and fine meanings yeah, right. like, what are you know you you always are so afraid to sign a contract right because of everything that's going on it's like they they word it differently <laughs> Well, that's why mm -hmm. you need to have a team or somebody like right. Amy, you know, you were mentioning Zayla team and, and to yep. make sure you're protected with that kind of thing. So right. speaking of teams, um, I know that Amy, you support your teams with the checklist that you were mentioning. Do you want to tell us one more time about that and what your gift to everybody is so we can share it with everyone again? Of course, Sandra, because I just adore you and you <laughs> ladies were so fun when I listened into the show before I, I put something kind of special together we don't normally put okay this is brand new that we're releasing this checklist <laughs> ever like really ever. yes it's wow. brand new yay it is that? a behind the scenes kind of thing that we've used but I've never put it out there so it's super super cool and it's fast because that's our acronym right fast so it's our the fast process so it's the fast product checklist and it goes over uh, where you have gaps and some ways to start to think about your product within a framework and it can be your entire product line as well so um we have that up on our web page and i think the um we have a way to text it to get it here too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. And also on that page, we did something else really, really fun. Um, I do 30 minute consults that are called product action calls for product lines. And those are normally $197. And we have given your people a code, very easy to remember, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. Perfect. Coffee on that page, they can pick one of those up for 
a 100% discount to make it free. Wow. Oh, oh my gosh. That's so huge. Awesome. I know where all of us are going right after this. You know, <laughs> I know where I'm going. I think we're losing people as we speak. They're, they're going now. <laughs> So, so um, Tammy, do you want to just explain to when they text how that's going to work? They, you, you text, so Amy, text, I mean, Tammy, this is your, this is your world. You explain. <laughs> <laughs> you'll text this number and there's going to be, you'll put in your email and then there's going to be a link there. You click on that link and then it will give you the promo code, remind you of the promo code. So you'll be able to go there and get the fast product checklist as well as um, a reminder for the code to put in so that you can get your free product to action call with Amy. I love that. Oh my gosh. This and is so Thank you. Wow. So thank you, Amy. I want to just make this really clear for everybody. That call is gold for you. We have one client, we saved them $150,000 in 10 minutes. We have wow. another client, we just saved her $22,000 in with one strategy that took about five minutes to explain to her. So it's not, wow. not just about saving money, it's also about growing. And we'll be making sure on that product action meeting that we definitely give you three action items for your specific stage for your specific product line. So, mm -hmm. there you and these are all physical products, correct? Like, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. we, so okay. physical products or um, we have some that are like an internet of things that have a database too. So we do work with internet of things products. Got it, got it, got it. Fantastic. Cool. Thank that you so much, Amy. It has been awesome to have you here and awesome. take their, your your time this morning to to share with us and our our viewers. And if the you know if you're watching this and this is something that you think speaks to you or you want to you think of somebody that might be great information for, please share it. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. That helps us to be able to know that you want more of Amy. Maybe we can have you back, Amy, when we we move a little bit further into our season here. Um, but please do share, like, and um, and go visit Amy's site, text book to 833-998-0553 and get moving on whatever your dream product actually is. So great. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank for you so much, Amy. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Have a good Bye. rest of your day. You Bye. too. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Now I want to go invent something. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> bring your salts back to life. Bring my, bring my bath salts back. I have to tell you, every time I go to buy bath salts, there's a little piece of me that's like, wow, that takes a lot to make that work because, yeah, <laughs> been there, done that. And you have a whole other things that you're doing these days. You have a whole farm that you're running. And yes, I have and other things. things. But you know, my oh, first two patents were actually on animal related things. So I haven't oh, come that far. Oh, that's yeah. Actually, I, you know, I've actually been granted five patents. And the one thing I didn't mm. ask her, which I'm going to, I'm going to call that number is because we're getting ready to do a, a product and, and I, and I'm, I, I'd be thinking, how do you license these patents? How do you actually monetize these patents? And I, I, and I, I know so yes. right. I'm trying to figure that out. You know, yes. there, that was one thing that, you know, I'd love to share with this audience because that was a big learning, you know, a big point that she raised about when you do file a patent, it just sits there for a year. People don't know that. Right. I didn't, and, I didn't even think I knew well, that. No, and you know the same thing happens with with trademarks. So I've trademarked a few of our products now, and I noticed that um, it's not just a done deal. You know, right. once you file the paperwork, I mean, what our brand name has the word Duke in it, and Duke University contested yes. our trademark, and we had to work together to figure out, you know, how we're going to make sure there's a separation there in the branding, and 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 that's part of the trademarking and patenting process. It's not just you're done. You have to continuously mm -mm. work with other brands to make sure that you're all, all staying in your own in your own lane. Uh, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in the middle of that right now. I'm in the middle of that right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to license my patent to the government, and I finally figured out because I was dreaming about you know, the problem. Being as an entrepreneur, your brain. Whoop, and I and I was talking to somebody, and somebody. Sometimes when you talk to people about what you're trying to do, the answer came, and I all of a sudden I knew the answer. The answer was not to patent the idea, but to patent the workflow that the idea fits in. Interesting. Okay. So I am getting ready to file a provisional patent 
But wow. I'm gonna, so it was very interesting that she does that. Nice. I am her. I am one of her clients. Trust me. I love Linda. Linda is here. Linda is amazing. Linda has, has quoted here. I've invented like two gazillion things. Yeah. <laughs> Every day she wakes up inventing something. <laughs> but you know, there are those that do that. Have you not done that? Where you where you've seen yeah. something you're like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. I should do that. Yeah. And exactly. well, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I wanted to put. <laughs> Grease, you know, you know how when you get rid of grease in the old days when you actually cooked and you had real grease and, and it was all I had an invention for a grease can that I didn't do and all of a sudden here it came and so you know we're we're always inventing. Where is that? You know, you know, yeah. Now I try to stick with digital because the cost to figure out whether you're right or wrong is a lot less. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to say uh, a shout out to people that are watching too, because when we first got on, somebody was watching from Indonesia. Oh, wow. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Yes. That's cool. That's cool that you can nice. do that. Welcome, Indonesia. That is awesome. We love to be international. Yes. It's fantastic. <laughs> We have a quote for today, which I think is uh, is pretty interesting. It's a little longer, but I think it is really powerful. So you guys ready? Yes. It comes from yes. Woodrow Wilson. You are not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achieve achievement. You are here to enrich the world and you impoverish yourself if you forget the errand. Uh, Woodrow Wilson. So a reminder to not give up and bring that product to market because exactly why you're here. Do exactly. not impoverish yourself. Definitely. 100%. Um, and next we're going to be, uh, are we going to talk about ducks in a row? Are we going to mention that today? Yes. So um, if you've been following us, our tribe, uh, we have a product that we've put together. We are all about financial literacy here, growing, empowering you to grow and protect your cash, credit, castle, and kingdom. Okay, so this is why the queens get together every week and we talk <laughs> about these things that aren't often discussed um, and shared openly. And we hope that you gain some really valuable information from watching us. But we want to take it a step further. We've created a program called Ducks in a Row. And uh, we, where we go step by step by step in helping you understand how to grow your cash, how to protect that, how to grow your credit and protect it, how to grow or purchase or buy your castle, your home, and protect that, and how to enhance your kingdom and protect that, which is so very, uh, very, very important, all these topics, right? So we want to bring you along with us. So if you're willing to do that. This is a course. This is a program. We're going to help you go step by step along with us. We want all of us to do this together. And the way to do that is, again, to text ducks to this number um, to get more information on getting your ducks in a row. And we'd mm -hmm. love to you have yes. you uh, join us getting your ducks in a row also. This can seem, I just want to add that everything that we've just said can seem really daunting. I mean, even if you just take protecting your kingdom, that can seem really daunting. And that's one of the reasons why the four of us decided we're going to walk through this together over a series of many months. And that's why we're saying we're inviting you to come and join us. Because when you have somebody by your side, it is no longer so daunting. You may experience that as you're watching the show and you get things explained on these different topics. Suddenly you're like, oh, you feel empowered because you've learned a little bit about it and you're able to take action on it. That's really what Ducks in a Row is all about. So if you text um, Ducks to this number on your screen, you'll actually be putting like your stake in the ground that you'll be one of the first people to get the opportunity to make this journey with us. So we're excited about that. So are we ready to sign off you guys? It's been awesome. Thank you everybody who is here. We have some free gifts to wait, wait, we can't go away without giving the free gifts out. You've got your free gift from Amy. Do we have an affirmation book today? We're going to give away. Yes, I think so. And I have my eye on a newcomer today. She found us on YouTube and, uh, I saw that. Yes. Very, very, uh, avid and, engaging today. So Abigail, Abigail Dill, welcome to our tribe. And we would love to send you an empowerment book uh, written by one of our queens, Sahela. 
And uh, so if you don't mind sending us your email address or private messaging us, we'd love to get that out to you. Yes, we need your email in order to make that happen. And we want you to join us next week, everyone, because next week we're going to be talking with Robert Garcia. He is the warrior strategist. And I love his tagline, which is, we're going to learn how to design our own paycheck. Yes? Okay. That's it, everybody. Right. It was great to have you here. Like us, subscribe, share, share, share. We will see you next week for now. We're out. Good night. Bye.